and baseball, my two perfect, my two favorite things. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here tonight. I'll, I'll introduce them quickly, and then we're going to get right into it because I want to talk baseball with these people. So we've got Jonathan Mayo. He's an MLB writer, MLB.com writer and draft expert, and also the producer of the 2018 documentary Heading Home about Team Israel. Uh, Ryan LaVarnway, longtime Team Israel player, 10-year MLB veteran, 2013 World Series champion, and he's now a, coach, a catching instructor for the Chicago Cubs. And Gabrielle Starr, senior Red Sox reporter for the Boston Herald and founder of the sports multimedia brand Girl at the Game. Thank you, all of you. Thank you all for, for being here to talk baseball and everyone uh, who's here to, to listen and, and ask your questions. Please put questions in the chat if you have them, and we will try to try to get to them all, but there's a lot to talk about. So before no, we get into so about... And if you're uh, not one of the four of us, please make sure you stay muted. Um, before we dive into the 2024 season, I'd love to start at the beginning for each of you. And hear your baseball origin story. When when did you fall in love with the game? Um, you know who who were your favorite players growing up? Bonus points if they were Jewish players. I thought you were asking us a question about Genesis there for a second. So in the beginning, you know. Go ahead, Ryan. You go first. You're the star. Me? Oh boy. Uh, I started playing baseball when I was five because my kindergarten teacher told my parents that I was bad at sharing. And then I needed to get involved in a team sport. Uh, so we went out for baseball. I took to it right away. Uh, I grew up in LA. So I was a Dodger fan. Sean Green, my favorite Dodger. He's the only Jew. Um, other favorite players were Chipper Jones, who I got to meet when I played for the Braves. Uh, Mike Piazza. Uh, you know, Jason Veritek ended up being a favorite when I, when I moved to the Northeast for college. And uh, yeah. Love the game. Gabrielle, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I actually don't remember when I fell in love with baseball because it's just been a part of my life since before I can remember. Um, my family have been Boston Red Sox fans for literally over 100 years. My great uncle, God willing, will be 106 in June. So he was born in 1918 and waited 86 years to see them reverse the curse. And now he's a hundred and almost six, um, hopefully. So it was just part of my life. Like I was going to the ballpark before I, you know, knew I was at the ballpark and I was wearing Red Sox shirts before I knew what the Red Sox were and, um, grew up right down the street, could hear the concerts from my bedroom window, which was great. Cause I couldn't afford to go to them. And then um, when I was like a little bit older, my dad would play Stratomatic with me, um, after synagogue and he had like every Stratomatic deck. He would talk to me about Jewish players. He would talk to me about Ted Williams and he would tell me baseball bedtime stories because it was either that or a Torah story. And I was like, I get enough of that at Salman Schechter day school of greater Boston. And then I just started writing when I was in my early twenties. Um, and then one day I wrote something for another great Jewish baseball person, Dr. Charles Steinberg, I wrote him an essay to thank him for giving me tickets to a Red Sox game. And he wrote back and he just goes, oh, so you're a sports writer. And it was like the last piece of like my puzzle had just kind of fallen into place. And I just started writing all the time. Um, even when no one was paying me and no one knew who I was and built a following, started doing sports, social media and podcasting and paid writing and then more paid writing and now the Herald. So dream job, dream team sometimes. <laughs> um, and it's an honor to be here. My beginning came far before Ryan's and Gabrielle's. Um, <clears throat> but I grew up in Northern New Jersey. Um, there weren't a lot of Jewish players when I was a kid. So I didn't have one, you know, that I liked. We're talking like late seventies. I kind of loved the Yankees because they were really, really good when it, when I first entered my baseball consciousness, but in my household, we always played the uh, Jew or not a Jew game. Um, my grandmother liked to do it with entertainers. And um, I quickly started doing it when it came to, to sports, although to, borrow the quote from airplane of you know, short conversation more often than not. Um, but, you know, I played sports through high school and that was it, but I, I pretty much realized 
then that I wanted to write or talk about it and uh, went to a, a college that had a really good daily newspaper and was a sports editor there and kind of just went from there, had a bunch of different jobs, worked at the New York Post for a while. And coming up in just a few weeks, I will hit my 25th anniversary of writing for MLB.com. Oh. Yes, the, inter the internet did exist back then, <laughs> barely. Great. Um, well, I guess I should also introduce myself because I, I missed that, but my name is Jacob Gervis. I'm the sports reporter for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Um, so like Jonathan said, I've been playing Jew or not Jew with my dad my whole life being a baseball fan, and now it's my job. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I grew up uh, not far from Gabrielle near near Boston. So growing up watching, you know, Kevin Euclid and eventually Ryan LaVarnway on the Red Sox was uh, was pretty cool for me. So Let's get into some more baseball talk. Uh, spring training is wrapping up. Obviously, we had the Seoul series in Korea, but for most teams, it's still been spring training. And I want to hear all three of you had very different spring training experiences. Jonathan, you had the the brand new prospect showcase. Gabrielle, you were in Fort Myers with the Red Sox. And Ryan, you're a coach for the first time. So I'd love to hear just briefly how that's been going for each of you. And, and then we'll get into the season and our Jewish roster. Ryan, you want to kick us off with your your first foray into coaching? How's that going? Oh, it's, it's weird. Um, it feels, it feels easy, I guess. I, I, I'm still going to the stadium every day. I'm still there all day, every day, but I don't have to hit a slider anymore. And I don't have to get foul balls off my arms and neck and thighs. So it, it feels uh, a lot the same because I'm still around the boys. I'm still talking about baseball, watching baseball. Um, but now I'm, I'm trying to help other people be their best instead of perform my best. And, and the one other thing about coaching that I noticed right away is when I was playing, there was objective feedback every day. Did I get a hit? Uh, did I throw anybody out? Did I catch a shutout as a coach? It's more of, did I help somebody today? Or sometimes you don't, you don't always know. Um, so you, you try to be the best version of yourself. You try to, uh, share when it's appropriate and, and hold back when you think it, it, it isn't going to help a guy um, and just try to, you know, help, help others really. And it's, it's uh, I don't know, it feels, it feels good. It feels fun. That's great. Gabrielle, how's Fort Myers? You know what? Um, it was really great. I mean, I was saying before we went on, it was a weird time to be there because my dad was visiting my sister in Israel. So the kind of the contrast of like what they were doing going down south was really weird compared to me kind of getting my head back into baseball. But it was also nice to kind of have that, you know, required time where I had to focus on something lighter. Um, it's a great group of guys. I really hope that the front office and ownership stuff doesn't overshadow that. Um, and that these guys actually get a chance to prove themselves since they're none of that stuff is up to them. Um, it was really fun to just be a not in Boston in February and, and B to see a lot of really promising top prospects, Jonathan, and, um, you know, to get to know more of the, the new major leaguers. I will say though, last year we had like three Jewish pitchers on the major league roster at different points. There was a lot of bagel talk in the clubhouse at various points in the season. And th this year, not so much, a little bit of a bummer. Um, but Tanner Houck is not Jewish, but he might love bagels more than I do. So that, that is fine. Cause he's the guy that will come up to you and be like, dude, there's no good bagels in Fort Myers. I've checked. I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do about this but have you heard of gold belly so now a bunch of the red sox players are ordering new york bagels from kosars delivered to fort myers which is really cute i love it yeah jonathan you want to just tell everyone briefly what the the showcase was and then you can sure well before that i ran around arizona for 12 days and i actually got to see ryan lavarnway in his natural habitat um as a as a, an instructor so it was kind of weird being on a backfield uh, on the other side of the fence with Ryan, uh, rather than watching him play. I'm sure it was strange for him too. Uh, then I was in Florida for uh, this new thing called the Spring Breakout, um, which uh, for my money was one of the coolest things anyone's come up with in quite some time. 
Uh, the basic idea is every team put together an all prospect team uh, and they faced off against another team's all prospect team. It was just one game, only a couple teams played two. We're hoping eventually we'll be able to build it out into kind of a, a mini tournament. Uh, but for me, it was really exciting to see uh, all of the top prospects uh, and the rosters were based on our top 30 lists playing against each other. Um, I don't know. I feel like Gabrielle would be like taking a Stratomatic game and putting it on the field because I spend so much time looking at these names. We don't get to see them play all that often. And then having them, but then they come to life sort of like, by the way, this is maybe the most genius movie idea ever, but like Stratomatic Jumanji, right? So Stratomatic comes to life. So uh, when we're done with this, Gabrielle, you and I are going to work on a movie script, I think. Oh my God. Remind me after Jonathan to send you someone made a video compilation of like every great baseball movie and it's like these little snippets and I it's not new but I guess I'd never seen it before and I saw it today and I was sobbing I don't know why but they just it was it was put together so masterfully I can actually I'll just drop it in the chat here so people can see it but it was like all over yeah. Twitter today and it was baseball's the best that's all I'll say certainly a romantic sport. Um, and for the fans here, we've got a lot of Jews to root for this year. So last year was a record year for Jews in the MLB. When, when Zach Geloff on the A's debuted in July, he became the 18th Jewish player, which we believe to be a record, obviously a very fitting number for the Jewish record in Major League Baseball. And this year, there could be even more. We could top 20. Um, and we J, uh, at JTA just published our season preview of all the Jewish players to watch. We can drop that link in the chat for you as well. But I wanted to get into talk about some of these players. Um, we've got stars like Max Fried and Alex Bregman, two of the best players in the game who happen to be Jewish, uh, both entering contract years. We're going to talk about that. Veterans like Jock Peterson and Rowdy Telez, both of whom are on new teams this year. Up and coming stars like Zach Geloff, Dean Kramer. A lot of these guys have played for Team Israel. So who, who are you each most excited to watch uh, in 2024 among our, um, our Jewish roster here? I'll, uh... I'm not just going first every time. Um, I I am a huge Garrett Subs fan. I know he doesn't get to play as often, but this dude plays like he's a giant, and he's like a little guy, but he makes me smile just thinking about him and watching him play. He's captain of the party patrol. Mm -hmm. He brings the vibes everywhere that he goes, and he brings so much more value than anything he could physically do on the field that I just love watching him. Him and, and Mayo just make me smile just thinking about him. I pay Ryan yeah. to say that every time we appear together. I'm also a huge Garrett Stubbs fan. I covered the Phillies, my first full-time baseball editing job. I was one of the teams I was covering was the Phillies. And so I was writing about him a lot um, when he was coming up. Such a fun guy. And then, I mean, I, I hate when he makes the games really difficult against the Sox, but Dean Kramer is really talented. And he's also just such a, so proud of his Jewish heritage. And we've had really nice conversations this year when it kind of feels like, you know, you want to like feel those connections in the baseball world, which is why this is so nice. He and I had a bunch of those kind of conversations talking about, you know, where's their good Israeli and kosher food in Boston and Baltimore. And there isn't very much. And, you know, like what's going on and what's frustrating us. And it's, it's nice to, to have people like that in this world. So you kind of bridge that gap. And then he's also just a super talented pitcher, which is exciting and, you know, makes us all look good too. I'm going to say the brothers Geloff, um, as I live in two worlds. Uh, Zach obviously played for Team Israel, and he established, started to establish himself as a big leaguer with the A's last year. Uh, I, I got a chance to know him when he was in the fall league, uh, the prior fall. He and Matt Mervis. Uh, Brian, you should have picked Matt Mervis since you're part of the Cubs organization. Now. Well, we're going we're gonna to get to to the guys that aren't guaranteed big leaguers. I was saving them. Oh, I see. Sorry, I'm jumping the guy. I can't help but always sort of pivot to prospects. But so Zach is in the big leagues and his brother Jake is just getting started um, coming out of the University of Virginia last year. Uh, so I, I'm excited because eventually I think both of them will play for Team Israel, I'm hoping. Uh, I'm curious to see what kind of player Jake ends up being 
you know, professionally. Uh, but it's just fun to have two, you know, Jewish brothers, uh, one, you know, one just getting started in the big leagues and the other hoping to catch up to him soon. Mm -hmm. I also just want to add that I'm really happy Rowdy Telez is no longer in the AL East because at a certain point, like a year or so ago, seven or eight of his 30 something career home runs were against the Red Sox. Like he was murdering the Red Sox. And it wasn't just one series. It was like for a span of multiple years with the Blue Jays. Every time he was around, he just... So good luck to him in Pittsburgh. And I'm very glad that that's no longer happening. (laughs) That's a perfect segue to my next question. So Telez is in Pittsburgh. We've got Richard Blyer, uh, Team Israel alum, who's now with the Nationals. Harrison Bader moved over to the Mets from the Yankees and Reds. So a lot of of Jewish players are, are wearing new uniforms this year. And Ryan, I know you have a lot of experience joining new teams. And I'm curious, like, take us into the head of a baseball player. Like, what's that like joining a new clubhouse at the beginning of the year, uh, especially for players like Telez, who had been in the same place for several years at a time? Yeah. So you walk into the new locker room and you want to earn trust and earn respect as fast as you can. And you earn respect and trust first by giving it and, and just being consistent in who you are every day. So you show up, you do the work, um, you prove that that you're going to be a hard worker, that you're going to be prepared. Um, and then you go out and, and do your thing and play and you just get to know the guys. Rowdy and I actually played together in the minor leagues with the Blue Jays back in 2016. Um, and we, our lockers were right next to each other. So we have a history. He's a, he's a tremendous dude. Um, Jock Peterson to change teams. I mean, he just has this aura of positivity around him. I remember when, when Jock first went to the Braves and he he was a spark plug for them. He just lit a fire, and the Braves took off and, and went through that World Series. Um, but these guys are going to be great. You know, they're they're just as good a people as they are players, uh, and they're going to add a lot to their new teams in the clubhouse and on the field. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is not joining a new team, but my my answer: I'm most excited to watch Max Fried. Um, I think if he stays healthy, he has a chance to like legitimately win the NL Cy Young if he could best his own teammate. Spencer Strider. Um, Jonathan, I'm curious what you've seen from from May, uh, your Mayo, from Freed the last few years. And like, it, is he the real deal? Can he stay on the mound? Like this, this could be the the best Jewish pitcher we've had since Sandy Koufax, right? If I could answer the question about whether a pitcher could stay healthy, um, I would not be sitting here on a Zoom with all of you. I mean, that's that's, that's the million dollar question at least, right? I I hope he can. Uh, you know, he's been through a lot. And when he does stay healthy, uh, he is one of the best pitchers in the National League and certainly one of the best left handers in all of baseball. Um, you know, hopefully he can put behind him you know, what set him aside last year. He was effective when he was on the mound for any stretch of time. So, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, he's the real deal. He's 30 years old at this point, you know, which I forget. It, was, it took him kind of a while to, to get to the big leagues because of the Tommy John surgery early and they, you know, they really took their time and kind of pushing him out and letting the, taking the kid gloves off. He had, he basically was off for two years after his first Tommy John surgery. So he's been through it. Um, and there's still not enough data for me for guys who have Tommy John surgery that early and what it can do for the rest of one's career. Now it's not been his elbow, but um, you know, I'm hoping it's a contract year for him as well. That often can be a huge motivator, uh, you know, but he could be the most motivated pitcher in the world. And if his body doesn't stay together, it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that's a, another good segue. So that's the case for both Max Fried and, and Alex Bregman. They're both entering their age 30 season, their contract year. There have been some, you know, rumors about extension talks with both of them, but I'm curious, like for our two reporters here, like what do you watch when a player is entering that kind of seminal year in their in their career i know there have been several ex, uh, examples with the red sox recently gabrielle but in general like what are you looking for with such an important year for these players so i mean i'm also obviously not in the front office i'm not on the player development side looking at this stuff i will say you know health is something that is both super important and also a total crapshoot because you literally have no idea um, and you know, Scott Efros is, is a great example of that, where he was really, really good for the Cubs. Then he goes to New York and immediately, you know, he's injured and then 
Tommy John, and then now back surgery. It's, you know, you have no idea. And the Red Sox have seen this with a billion people where like, you know, Ryan knows like they get a pitcher like David Price and then he would massively underperform and his elbow would have to magically heal itself. All these, you know, weird things. I think at a certain point, you kind of just have to bite the bullet and say, this guy's really good. He has this potential and we're going to either take a shot in the dark or we're not. Um, and the Braves have obviously had a lot of success doing that because at the end of the day, you can't predict. So I mean, honestly, it's hard to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, I think with contractors, it's also this weird thing of like, okay, are you playing this well because you want the contract or are you just this good again or better than you used to be? Like, you know, because we have also seen players who, you know, and not in, not even saying it in a bad way, but they get comfortable once they don't have that stress hanging over their heads necessarily. Um, I would say it's not the norm, obviously, um, but at the very least, the perception might be that, or even subconsciously, they're just they're they've lost that kind of anxiety about you know what my future holds. Um, but I think it's really hard to say, and I think it's more of a case by case case basis, but Ryan's a player. So I feel like he would know better than, than I would. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, like we talked about entering a new clubhouse, but what's it like entering a season, not knowing, you know, not having that, uh, long-term, uh, you know, safety net. Well, I, I didn't have a two week safety net for most of my career. So it's something that's unique to, to sports where you feel like you have to earn your job over and over every night. And for these guys that are established, you know, all-stars, Bregman, Fried, these these guys aren't earning their job. They're earning generational wealth this year. Really, it's it's life-changing type money. And as a fan of the game, I want to see them wear the same uniform their whole career, right? I, I wish it was still that way with all these superstars because I've gotten used to seeing them in an in an Astros uniform, in a Braves uniform. I'd love to continue to see that, especially because they've both won a World Series there. What else do you want? Ryan, you were a Red Sox player. I mean, you know, people don't get to stay forever anymore. Never Look know. at the Soul what Series I, what I have, today. Would I have loved to stay with the Red Sox forever? Heck yeah. I mean, this morning I'm watching Mookie and Xander. Now a shortstop and second baseman and not the ones you thought that they were going to be. And they're both in <laughs> South Korea playing for the Dodgers and the Padres. And you're like, oh, all right. right. You know, it's fine. You're only one of the richest sports ownership groups in all of the world, but it's fine. I was, I was hanging out with, with Mark McGuire at camp the other day. His son is in the yeah. minor league system. And, and, and we were talking about how much that's changed. Right. Where, you know, he obviously went from the A's to the Cardinals. I remember him as a Cardinal because that was about when I started really paying attention to baseball after he made the shift. But just to be able to see him with one team in my memory. And and then he talked about the rule changes with the difference in how long the um, injured list is 21 days versus 10 days versus, you know, sometimes you call a pitcher up for one day and ship him back out like the tenure of players on teams in all respects has been shortened by a lot. I think it's also just, it's so much more numbers in every possible way. It's so much more about analytics. It's so much more about the, you know, the payroll and the tax and everything than it used to be. Like, I think baseball and maybe it's just the nostalgia and kind of like the, the rose colored retrospective glasses, but I feel like baseball used to be so much more about a feeling because you didn't have all of that stuff. So it couldn't change, it couldn't impact it the way it does now, where like there, it meant something when you, like you said, when a player spent their entire career in the same uniform. And even though David Ortiz technically started his career in Minnesota, like the one, one of the only good things that has come out of the last decade in Boston is that when he started thinking about retirement after years of him doing these short-term contracts, you know, like doing these short-term contracts, they're trying to lowball him. He's taking hometown discounts, which is insane. They finally went to him and they're like, we will pay you whatever you want to retire as a Red Sox. And thank God, because if they hadn't done that, I'm pretty sure that Red Sox fans would have burned everything to the ground. 
So, you know, there, there is something to be said for every once in a while for a really special player. You kind of just say, you know what, this is a guy where it's more than just the numbers, right? Albert Pujols coming home is more than just numbers. It's about leadership and champions, you know, champion expertise and who they meant to us, like who this person was to us and to these fans who have been paying for years and supporting this team and this player. And they deserve, and he deserves to have this kind of storybook ending, even if middle chapters were not so great. And Gabrielle, I'd argue that David Ortiz may have technically started as the twins, but big poppy had his whole career in Boston. Exactly. Exactly. Said. And, and that's why the guy got before his last game was even played. They're like, we named a bridge after you. We're naming a gate at the airport after you. You get your number of retired next summer. We're like, dude, the, the postseason hasn't even started yet. You Technically, he's not even retired and you are retiring his number at a set date next summer. And he's still about to DH right now. It's just, it says everything. Um, and I wish I wish there was more of that still now because it feels like there's just going to be less and less and less. I guess well, time will tell what will happen with uh, with Fried and Bregman. But just to go back to this this growing Jewish roster that we've got, so we've mentioned a lot of these names. You know, there are even more guys we haven't talked about: Jake Bird, Deed Kramer. Uh, the list goes on. I'm curious for each of you in your current roles, and like I know um, we didn't mention this in your ever-growing bio, Ryan, but you've also done some baseball broadcasting. I'm curious how much you have time or interest or space to track these Jewish players in your jobs. Whether I know it's not your job to do it in the way that it is mine, but I'm curious, like when you're, you know, reading box scores or keeping up with the news, um, like how much do you personally care and and root for, or maybe not root for, because, you, you know, objective journalism, but pay attention to how the Jewish players are doing throughout the season. Who's That's starting all, all three of you. Mayo, you go. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> um, all right, you can tell me what to do. Um, I mean, I pay attention to it all the time. I, you know, I, I can't say that I do it for my job per se, um, but I do like, uh, I mean, I've, I've long liked to track who the Jews are coming into baseball and as a sort of um, unofficial helper of Team Israel to identify players uh, I, I you know I feel like it's important for me to know each year you know in the draft um you know who in the who who's coming from the drafts who might be Jewish who are players in the minor leagues that are Jewish and and making sure the proverbial is Israel baseball powers that be know who they are um, they do a pretty good job of identifying everybody but um but I've always liked you know I've always liked tracking that and you know going back to years and years ago talking to sean green um when he was visiting with the dodgers at, was at shea stadium and having a conversation with him behind the cage about how he called his grandpa he, he was not religious at all growing up um but he called he he called his grandparents booby and zadie and but he didn't like really totally understand why um it was just what he was taught to call them. And I, and I said that that was probably the first time that I had a very surreal intersection of my Jewish life and my baseball life to have that conversation, you know, uh, on the field at Shea Stadium, uh, you know, during batting practice. So it's long been a, a fascination of mine. Gabrielle, how about you? I, I know you mentioned there were three Jewish players, uh, all pitchers on the Red Sox at various points last year. But even aside from Boston, how, how do you keep track of, of the Jews in, in Major League Baseball? Um, I mean, I'm definitely that annoying person on Twitter who's like, our Jewish baseball king anytime. Like, I've done that to Ryan before. I'm like, Ryan Lavernway, our Jewish baseball king. I'm very much that person who's always kind of out there saying this. I think my bio still says loudly and proudly Jewish. Um, I actually did a really cool thing. I talked to Ryan Sheriff last year. He was in Worcester at the time, actually, but I went to Worcester and interviewed him before um, Holocaust Remembrance Dio Mashoa last year. And he talked to me about his grandparents being Holocaust survivors and, and you know, learning more about, you know, his one of his grandparents, um, at least one of his grandparents had tattoos because they had been 
their, they had numbers because they had been in Auschwitz and, you know, kind of his Jewish identity. And then we ran that story right before or on the day of Holocaust Remembrance Day. And that was really meaningful for, for me. And it was really nice for him to kind of talk more about that, um, though I know it's not the first time. I, funny enough, I keep up a lot with Jacob Steinmetz because I'm friendly with his dad. And so anytime something's happening with him, his dad will send it to me. And actually his dad wrote me tonight and was like, please make sure that this is recorded because I, because I can't, I can't attend. <laughs> yeah. See, um, so I, I try to keep up as much as possible. I know we have Dalton Guthrie in our, I think he was optioned to AAA this week. Um, and his dad is Mark Guthrie, um, former major leaguer. So I try to, you know, and then if there's someone in the Sox clubhouse, who's Jewish, like last year, it was very funny because this one day early in the season, Richard Blyer, you know, I had introduced myself to Richard Blyer and then Kevin Euclid was standing in the clubhouse with some of the other Nesson people. And I'm talking to Tom Karen from Nesson and Euclid about how Zoftigs, which is not even kosher, but it is a kosher style deli in Brookline right near the ballpark. Apparently like a ton of Red Sox people love Zoftigs and not just the Jewish people, which is not surprising because it's very much not kosher. And Richard Blyer comes over and he's like, did I hear bagel chips? <laughs> Cause that's like their specialties. They bring you bagel chips with cream cheese. And all of a sudden, all of these people in the clubhouse are just like listening to this conversation about Jewish delis and kosher restaurants and Israeli restaurants. And I'm giving everyone like this list. And, um, and now I've become that person that like various Jewish and non-Jewish p- baseball players will be like, Hey, can I have your restaurant recommendations for Boston? And I'm like, Okay. So it's, it's fun. Um, and I, I take that, um, the kind of Jewish welcoming committee thing very seriously. Cause I feel like, especially now it's nice to kind of have, to find your people. Um, so. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I know you, you've played with a lot of these guys and now you get to watch them uh, what, and some coach, some of them. What's, what's that like? Yeah, so I see Merv around the the clubhouse and the cafeteria in spring training, and it's I, I feel a sense of camaraderie, right? I feel like you're not supposed to have a favorite kid, but the the two Jewish prospects in our minor leagues are my favorite kids, and I feel the same way. Like even when I was playing against a lot of these guys, you root for them, right? Like I I feel pride when they do well. Like I feel like we're all connected in a way. Uh, and I'm I'm always rooting for all these guys, even when we're playing against them, even when I'm not supposed to have a favorite, like like Mervis hit an absolute nuke today in the minor league spring training game, 107 off the bat. It cleared the batting cages behind the field. And it's like that. There you go. That's one of us. Like, I feel great about every time he he's successful. Mm hmm. Yeah. Why do you think, especially in baseball, representation is so important? I mean, Jonathan, you said you didn't have a lot of Jewish players to watch growing up, but like kids today, Jewish kids today, I should say, like they this is the golden age of Jewish baseball. And that's pretty special. Like, why why do you think this representation is important? Well, I think no matter what community you're from, you want to see people who you think are like you doing things at the highest level. It doesn't necessarily have to be just sports. Uh, But I think especially when you're a small or minority community uh, and there have been so few Jews and, you know, insert stereotypes about Jews not playing sports or parents not letting their kids play sports and and things like that. But I think that it gives it gives people something to aspire to, Uh, you know, and put aside the the facts of how difficult it is to even play one day in the major leagues. Um, you know, kids all the time have those dreams. And I think it enables kids and, and even adults to have someone to look up to, uh, you know, to, to, to follow because there hasn't, there hasn't always been those kinds of role models or examples. And, you know, not that I want to sort of turn down a dark corner, but I think that's part of the reason why the uh, cheating scandal with the Astros was hard for a lot of people, I think, in the Jewish community to swallow because Alex Bregman was involved. Regardless of what you think, the you know his, his culpability, 
it was tough. Or Ryan Braun when he tested positive, you know. So because we put these guys up on a pedestal, I think we all put athletes too much up on a pedestal. But especially when it's within your own community and you want to say, do it like this guy, then you don't want to be disappointed by them. Now, more often than not, we haven't been. But uh, I, I think there is a need to sort of see people who you think could have come from your own family doing the thing that people dream about. Mm-hmm. I would, I would add to that, that, you know, I loved baseball growing up, but I was a girl. So when I wanted to play baseball at school, our coach said, no, well, you're a girl. So you have to play softball and then made fun of me because my dad had taught me to pitch overhand because I wanted to play baseball. And then looking at, you know, baseball writing, you know, Boston sports have these incredible legendary sports writers, but most of them are men. So I didn't see basically any women represented in my market for a job. And therefore I had never even really considered that as something like, I thought I love baseball. I like writing about it, but it wasn't until someone actually said to me like, well, you should try to do this that I was like, well, maybe I will, because if you don't see someone, if you're, if you don't feel like you're represented you, it's hard to visualize the path to doing it. But when you see somebody like you doing something, you're like, well, if they can do it, so can I. Um, and I think it's the same thing for Jewish people. And also, you know, the interesting thing with baseball is like baseball is very tribal. Judaism is obviously very tribal. And so I think it's even more amplified the way that we're both very proud of Jewish athletes and Jewish baseball players specifically, but also we are very protective over them. And therefore, when we feel betrayed by them, even if we do have never met them before, um, it hurts much more. And also because we know that the rest of the world, a lot of people have never met a Jewish person. And so when they see a Jewish, prominent Jewish person doing something wrong, that's their impression of Jewish people, fair or not. And so it reflects badly on all of us. And it's not like we can really afford more things reflecting badly on us. So we're kind of like, dude, are you kidding? Do we not have enough to deal with? And so that's really hard. Um, But I think ultimately the community thing is really special. And I've had Jewish baseball players say to me before, like, it's so cool when someone Jewish is just like happy to meet me because they feel that connection to me. Um, Because it's true. Like you just kind of feel more at home when you meet somebody who's like, you know, part of, part of the tribe. Yeah. Ryan, I'm guessing you've had some of those fan interactions. Um, what's, what is that like on, on the personal side? It's honestly, that's one of the the best things about having played for team Israel is everywhere I went after that, the fans that were Jewish fans would find me and come up and we'd have this, a great conversation they talk about how their son watched or how they were so proud. And it it's, it's just such a positive experience every time I get to interact with people like that. Um, and it, when I spoke at the Jewish National Fund's Global Conference for Israel in December, I was walking in, you know, probably 2,500 people on the streets walking into this conference. And I got stopped three times going in by high school aged kids. They were like, hey, I've been watching you play on Team Israel for the last eight years since I was eight years old, and it's my goal to play on Team Israel now. And I just I remember when they made that first documentary from the 2017 team, the last line of the movie, it wasn't me that said it, but somebody said, like, I grew up watching Sandy Koufax, and he was my favorite player, and it's crazy to think that we might be that for somebody. And it's starting to come true only seven years later. We have these kids that will be the next generation of Israel baseball, the next generation of Jewish baseball players in America. And they were inspired by our team, by, by what Mayo helped put together and what I got to be a part of it. And it's, it, it's, it, it inspires me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let, let's talk about Team Israel. Uh, I, I've heard you tell your story about this like so many times, but I want to make sure everybody here knows the Ryan LaVarnway Team Israel story, because it seems like it has sort of come to define your career. Um, I hope you're okay with me saying that. But it, you did, that, that was unexpected for you when that happened. So can you just tell everyone here, like, what that was like and how you got involved and how you became the first ever captain of Team Israel? Oh, boy. Yeah. So, and this is exactly what I wrote my my children's book about, was 
you know, I grew up in a mixed religion household where we didn't have religion. My mom's Jewish. My dad is disenchanted Catholic. And we just celebrated Hallmark holidays. And it really wasn't until Team Israel called that I, I stepped into my, my Judaism publicly. I kind of dove in with both feet and was embraced by the community globally. And um, I say in, in, the, in my book, more than anything, he felt a growing sense of pride. People said, you're one of us. Welcome to the tribe. Um, and that's, that's really how I feel to me. My, my relationship with Judaism is community first. Like I feel more proud to be Jewish because of you guys, because of everybody on this call. So first of all, thank you for being my people. Um, but it, it makes me want to share it with everybody. Like I love being Jewish and I love being a member of this community. So playing for team Israel it really changed my life. And, you know, if I, if I'm still physically capable, I'll see you in three years. I'll be back on the field. We'll see. Oh, all right. Making some news tonight, Ryan. Um, and I'm Jonathan, sure, I'm I know, sure they'll want Garrett to catch, but I could, I could, uh, I yes, could or, or his younger <laughs> brother too. Um, Jonathan, I know you've been involved, as you've said, in some capacity with the team. I'm curious, like what that experience has been like for you professionally and and just more broadly, like having some of these bigger name players like Jock Peterson, who played last year, like what does that mean for the program and, and the growth of Jew, vi more visibly Jewish baseball than just like MLB? It's hard to put into words. Um, you know, I mentioned that that interaction I had with Sean Green years ago. So take that and turn you know the volume up to 11. Uh, that's a Spinal Tap reference if you're not paying attention. Um, that... You know, when this first started coming into my consciousness, I was beyond excited. You know, I went on Young Today, your course, I spent a year in Israel. Um, my sister and her family have lived in Israel for 34 years now. Um, and and I love baseball. And I, I kind of thought it would, you know, never the twain will meet. Uh, you know, I, I did some stories on the ill-fated Israel Baseball League. Um, I saw someone in the chat asking about Ron Bloomberg. I interviewed him once because he managed um, in that in that one-year league. And then this started coming together, and I cannot describe the joy that I have had being associated with Israel Baseball. Uh, you know, when you do this for a long time, you kind of, it's hard to be a fan of a team. Uh, maybe you root for individual players. Um, little inside knowledge, I tend to root for guys who, who talk well, because you want guys who can talk, because that's what I do for a living is, you know, guys, guys who speak well. No, talk. Um, you got to be kidding me. Oh, um, I would I would watch this buddy comedy all day. I'm just saying, yeah, 162 uh, episodes, a whole baseball season. Give me a mini series, everything. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll put on, we'll put on uh, wigs of each other's hair for one of the episodes. Wow, really? You went there, did you? That is a low blow, Ryan. Hey, bald yeah. guys are hot. <laughs> and shave your head. Was waxing eloquent here for a second and uh, then you were saying <laughs> yeah you think off made it go off the rails i just you know the players are on the team and the connection to my judaism just made it so easy to root for them and i remember way back i think it was in 2012 was the year that josh side was in the arizona fall league and there was talk of and my years might be slightly off but there was talk of putting together a team to try to qualify for that world baseball classic, which they, they fell short. And, and I remember I had never met Josh before then. And, um, and he was all in before I could get the words out of my mouth. And it's been like that since, you know, both in terms of that team and then talking to players about the trip to Israel, uh, that makes up the, the first half of, of heading home. Um, you know, and then moving on from there. And Jock Peterson, I had a Facebook memory come up recently. Nine years ago, I actually interviewed Jock Peterson about this very subject 
in the hopes of it being part of kind of an earlier edition of what that movie might have been, which would have been taking uh, you know big leaguers to Israel. Um, we had interviewed Josh in the fall league that year. We, I hadn't I didn't meet Ryan until we went to Israel for the movie. Um, but so seeing. I've always been taken by baseball players' willingness to embrace being known as a Jewish baseball player, because I think we all know that that often and maybe always it could come with a little bit of risk, and nowadays maybe even more so. And to see players can even come back to it, like so, Jock Peterson didn't come on that trip. He didn't play on that first World Baseball class, the the, the team that Ryan was on in in Korea and Japan. But then he came around and, and played and helped recruit players. So it, um, it, it has been probably the most meaningful part of my uh, very long and relatively mediocre career. Uh, and this week we had the news that Israel, that the team, the folks at Team Israel, some of whom are on this call, are launching a new organization based here in the U.S., Israel Baseball Americas, to further all this work, uh, to raise money, to build a talent pipeline of players like Ryan, uh, but starting, you know, super young so that they can one day grow up to play for Team Israel, which, as I've been told, many kids are starting to say, like, you know, my dream is to play for Team Israel, not just to play for, you know, the Red Sox or Yankees. And, and Ryan, I know you're going to be involved in that organization. I'm curious if you could just tell us a little bit about it and why you feel so strongly about staying involved even after you're potentially done playing. Yeah, so this is something that's been in the works for a while. Um, Nate Fish, Adam Gladstone, all these guys have been putting it together. I get messages once a month at least of like, hey, you know, I'm Jewish. I'm in high school or, hey, I'm Jewish. I'm at a junior college. Do you know anyone... Uh, with Team Israel or could you put me in contact with the decision makers and for the longest time it was like sure here's Nate Fish's email address and it was kind of loosey-goosey no process to it and now they're turning it into just a, a well-oiled machine um, where we can get more people involved right include more people get a bigger community around it uh, do showcases workouts um speaking events, community fundraising galas, uh, community building events, uh, and just really put a whole thing together. And it's also going to help fund the, the national team's travel and tournament expenses because in, in back uh, in September, we went to Prague to play in the European Championships. It's not cheap to bring 28 people to a tournament like that, put them up in a hotel for two weeks, uh, get the buses, the security. So um, this new organization is going to help fund the national team, and it's going to help get more people involved here stateside. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's an article up on JTA. You can you can read it. We'll try to put the, the link in the chat with more about this organization. And if you are a fan of Team Israel and want to buy merch or donate, there's there are ways for you to do that starting soon. Um, Gabrielle, I'm curious for, for some of those guys who were on the Red Sox last year, um, you know, Richard Blyer. And Zach Weiss both pitched for Team Israel last year. Ryan Sheriff pitched for them, I think, actually in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Did, did they talk? He he did at some point. It wasn't this past uh, WBC, but um, did you talk no, to him? He, wasn't, he wasn't eligible last year. Right. Um, he was kind of coming off some injury or something, so it was like couldn't hmm. do it. I'm curious if, if you spoke to any of those three guys about um, you know, what that experience was like or or how it kind of played into them going straight into the MLB season. Uh, right after a tournament. So I did talk to Ryan um, just because he was so bummed that he couldn't do it. Um, and, you know, frustrated with, you know, he's like, I get the rules, but it's like, I wanted to do this. I wanted to be with this group. I wanted to, you know, to contribute. Um, and I talked to Zach Weiss about it very briefly. Everyone I've talked to, um, and I've done a lot of Team Israel stuff over the years, just raves about the experience. Um, I used to live right down the street from Ty Kelly in Los Angeles. And he actually joked that I helped him prolong his playing career because I started dragging him to yoga classes with me. Cause I was like, you need to be more to borrow Tom Brady's word pliable. I was like, why do you think Aaron judge and John Carlos Stan are getting hurt all the time? Cause they're focusing on bulking up and they're not get, staying flexible. So I would drag him to yoga classes with me. And he would talk to me about how you know, he also, like Ryan, grew up um, in an interfaith home and, you know, like 
some Jewish stuff, but not a lot. And being part of Team Israel was what made him feel so much more connected to his Jewish identity. And, and he was learning all these things and he was so excited to go become a citizen and, and actually experience the country and all this stuff. And, and then he would talk to people about it. And I think that that's also part of it is, you know, it's not just about getting to be with each other, you know, getting to be in that brotherhood of team Israel, but it's also about the, the sense, I mean, Ryan would know better than I, but it's the sense of kind of your Judaism, I guess, feels from what I've heard more prominent in your life. And therefore you're, it's more on display, I guess, or it kind of is like shining out of you a little bit more and, and, and you're kind of talking about it more. And I know Ty was like, you know, talking to non-Jewish guys on the teams that he was with about going to Israel and how awesome it was. And I actually had a Red Sox player come up to me at spring training who follows me on Instagram. And they were like, Hey, I see everything that you've been posting about Israel. And for a second, I was really nervous because I was like, you have, there's two very, very different ways that this could go. And then he goes, I just wanted to tell you, like, I think it's really amazing. I've learned a lot from you and um, I support you. And thankfully I was wearing sunglasses. So the, the, the guy couldn't see me like basically start crying, but it's like, you know, when you have the players in the clubhouse doing this stuff, it's even bigger because it's like, this is your teammate. This is your brother. You guys are in the trenches together and you're going to get to know them. And that means you're also going to get to know more about Jewish people and Israel. Um, and so I think it all is very kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy or, you know, um, symbiotic thing where, you know, if baseball is invested in Israel and Israel is invested in baseball and, you know, same thing for Jewish people, it's, it's, it's just great for everybody. Um, so I'm very excited for the next step here in the state side. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we only have a few more minutes and there are a couple more topics I want to get to. And we did promise everybody an exclusive Jonathan Mayo Jewish prospect preview. So the, the name Jacob Steinmetz has come up. Um, his father, Elliot, has also come up. He's the basketball coach at Yeshiva. But Jacob Steinmetz in 2021 was the first known Orthodox Jew drafted into Major League Baseball. And he has the dream to be the first Orthodox Jew to play Major League Baseball. Um, he's now playing in single A with the Diamondbacks. But Jonathan, what do you know? What can you tell us about Jacob or, or other prospects? I know Colton Gordon's got some hype around him. Like, who who are you watching as the, the Jewish prospect guy? Well, I already mentioned the younger Galoff. So uh, I definitely am curious to see if his swing translates to pro ball and wood bats and all that. Um, I saw Jacob Steinmetz in Diamondbacks camp. Uh, he is a monster of a human being now. Um, I mean, he was always big, like tall, but he is, you know, when you draft a really young, projectable high school right-hander, the hope is that they fill out that frame and they start throwing harder and the stuff gets better. Um, people may go and look at his numbers from last year and not be overly impressed, but look at his last, like, six starts. Uh, he threw the ball very well down the stretch. Um, I think the Diamondbacks knew that he was going to be a little bit of a project. And this is a guy who, you know, went to a, a yeshiva, basically, for, for all of high school, except for the brief amount of time where, right before the draft where he went down and played for one of these Florida uh, everyone comes into like not IMG, but one of those kinds of places just so he could be seen more. Uh, but so he was raw and, and, you know, not to mention also from, you know, a Northeast cold weather climate. So that's another hurdle to clear. I think that he has a chance to take a big step forward this year. Uh, you know, they, they didn't send him out right away last year. They kind of treated him with kid gloves. Um, I think that uh, he could really kind of jump on the prospect radar a little bit more. He flirted with their top 30 uh, briefly. Um, I hammer away at my colleague, Sam Dykstra, who does their top 30 list to get him added. Uh, but it's hard to argue you know, too much, but I'm, I'm hoping he earns his way on this year. And then I will throw uh, two other names at the Cardinals just because they're fresh in my mind. One is Zach Levinson, um, who they drafted out of the University of Miami last year. He hit a homer in the spring breakout game that we did on MLB Network. Absolutely crushed it. Uh, but he's got a chance to hit him with some power. Corner outfield, probably left fielder all the way. And then a way under the radar, and it's just because it's a local uh, kid. His name is Tanner Jacobson, who was 
a senior sign uh, out of a Division II school. What's well, now a Division I school called Queens University in North Carolina. Uh, he played with my son in high school here in Pittsburgh, and we just got to see him. And he is also a massive reliever all the way, but he's got a fastball up to 95 and a slider that routinely tops 3,000 RPM spin rate wise. Uh, I think he has a chance to actually be a big league reliever, which would be saying something for a 10th rounder who signed for $5,000. Um, and uh, Israel Basel already knows about him. Uh, he had to, you know, do the prove that you're Jewish thing, and he has. So uh, that's another name just to keep an eye on. Won't be necessarily on a lot of prospect lists, but if you tell me he ends up pitching, you know, middle relief in the big leagues in a couple of years, it wouldn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Steinmetz says he's got a ways to go, but if you can strike out Manny Machado at 19 years old on national television, I've got faith that you're going places, that's for sure. Um, we are technically at time, but there's one more question that I have to ask because it's my favorite one to pose to Jewish baseball people. Um, Jews have loved baseball forever, and I want to know why you think that is. What What is it about baseball that has made it the Jewish sport? Um, we could do rapid fire because we got to go, but I want to hear what you all think about this. Ryan, you go gotta, ahead. You got to say who goes first, Jacob. Ryan, go. Me? Oh, boy. Uh uh, I it's something that somebody in the Olympic delegation from one of the other sports said to me that I'll never forget. I, I think of it all the time. Um, as as Jews and as Israelis, we're always proud when we can punch above our weight. And I, I feel like baseball is such a sport where underdogs have a chance on any given night. Anybody could win. Um, and, and I love the idea that that you have a chance to punch above your weight every single night. I like that. Gabrielle. Yeah, I mean, not to not to sound too much like Ryan, but uh, it's it's kind of like David and Goliath, right? You've got we're we're what point zero two percent of the global population or something, or point two percent of the global population. We're we're tiny, um, and then there's been twenty something thousand men in the history of the world who have made it to Major League Baseball, so. I think the combination of kind of just defying the odds, which is like what Jewish people have done for thousands of years, you know, everyone tries to kill us, we survive and they die. Um, you know, people think we can't do anything. We do it. Um, it's, it's just the, it's a really baseball, I think is just a sport that's very emblematic of the Jewish experience in terms of the grit and determination and fortitude, um, to do what people think you can't do and be something that people don't think you can be. And so it's a really awesome feeling to kind of be both Jewish and being in baseball because then it's just like double the fun, um, you know. Jonathan, bring us home. So I'm the son of a history professor and my mom would disown me if I don't give a quick sort of, uh, this is an heirloom that's been handed down from generation to generation. And it really starts back from, from immigration when mass quantities of our people you know, were fled the pogroms in Europe and came through Ellis Island and settled uh, in the States, largely in, in New York, but in, in urban centers. And at the time, baseball was an urban sport. Um, it wasn't so much later when, when, when we had the great migration to the suburbs that things really started to change. But between it being an urban sport that anyone could just pick up and play, even if it was stickball, uh, it was really seen as a way for Jews trying to find their way in a new country, in a new language to fit in. Um, and, they, and, and it often was the only way um, for, for that transition to, to be made. And I think that's where it really started to take hold and we just haven't let go of it. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to everybody who came to watch and, and talk with us and, and Gabrielle, Jonathan, Ryan, thank you so much for your time. I know you're all very busy this time of year. Um, this was so much fun. Um, this was like my favorite hour of the month. So thank you for doing this. And I saw a lot of requests to do more of this. So I'm going to keep bothering the three of you to come talk to me again. So Jacob, you, before, before we, Jacob, before we wrap, can I just say something? Please. You, I mean, I'm I'm on with you three. You guys are all members of the media. 
not every member of the media is as honest and trustworthy and wonderful as the three of you. So Jonathan and Gabrielle got a lot of love this this hour. But Jacob, I want to send you some love as one of the best that there is in the business. Thank you for putting this together. You're thank the you. man. Yeah. Thank you. It thank was, you. Thank you. As we it would say, it was a co- it was a covered. So thank you so much. Um, Enjoy the baseball season, everybody. Please sign up for our newsletter if you don't get it already. It's going to be in your inbox tomorrow morning uh, with the Zoom link for this event if you have friends or family who you think might want to watch. Um, And have a great night. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.